Thank you, Brie. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. So, in this workshop, you will learn proficiency, so competency and cognitive ability, separating the doing and the thinking, followed by process and operations. So, like a lot of the platform thinking, tooling, support, and training of the things that you do that feed back into uh, the design team that you're a part of. Culture and community. What are you exposing yourself to? Who are the type of people that influence what you design and how you design? So internal, you know, like the design guild that you're a part of at whatever organization you're at. External, design apps. Design apps. <laughs> Leaders and practitioners. Measuring yourself against the leadership that is carving your path in like building the future that you have in design. Personal and professional development. At the end, we're going to identify what a KPI is, what a personal KPI is, and some of you are going to write it down and share it via Twitter, and we'll read them out. And we'll figure out together what drives you to be a designer, to be a thinker, and how to apply that to your personal growth that it feeds back into your career growth. Next slide. And it's lovely Laura driving the ship. So I was actually thinking on the way here, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go do this presentation about how to grow as a designer. And that's something I always really struggled with in my career was figuring out how to move up um, because I felt like I was getting stuck. And I think it's a result actually of our industry being formed in a really strange way, unlike most others. Like we have people who come from formalized backgrounds. I'm sure some of you went to university. Some of you are self-taught. Some of you are already on your second career going to a boot camp, and at the same level, you might apply to four different job titles that have four different sets of responsibility, and you're a valid candidate for all of them. So we're throwing the net kind of wide because there's a lot of nuance in there that's open for interpretation still, but don't be discouraged if when you see a posting or an opportunity or a description, you're not hitting every single mark because nobody hits every single mark. Um, we all have different struggles. So traditionally thinking about having a role as a designer is your doing. And that's where we all start when you begin. Your job is to help someone else execute their goal. You're not immediately going to be able to start in, you know, from the ground up with research and do a discovery cycle and come out with a result of launch. You're going to focus on making things, and that goes everything from helping to create the research, whether it's you know drafting the proposal for that, finding participants, interviewing them, expertise of craft. So being a designer and doing what we do, which whether it be wireframes or UI design, helping to produce deliverables, to mentoring is still doing as well. Even when you're starting out, you can be mentoring. Mentor your co-ops, mentor students. Uh, contact wherever you went to school, if you went to school, or use Design X and reach out to other people who want help to learn something, and you can start getting your management experience immediately. But as you keep growing, you're going to start to ask more questions about why you do these things. You're like, why am I putting that button there? The brief is, you know, add this functionality to a page. But then you're going to start to be like, why am I adding that button to the page? What problem am I actually trying to solve? And is that button solving it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And so that's when the thinking, I don't want to say the soft skills, but the more internalized skills come in, where you're able to flex a little bit more of professional intuition. And you're kind of like, that feels like it might be a weird thing to do, or a weird place to put that. Conceptual resources. So that means drawing on past experiences that you've had or people around you have had and applying that to what you're trying to do. Best practice knowledge, information processing, strategic prioritization, being like, is this the most important thing for the business? Should I focus on this before I focus on that? And so it becomes the way that you think about a brief when you get it, instead of immediately taking it, turning around and doing it, to the internal work you do before you begin to assess it, and whether or not you go back and you say, actually, we might not need to do all of that. It could just be a copy change. Or you could be asked to do a copy change, and you're like, actually, it might be a little bit more work than that. 
That happens. Usually it's... So growing as a designer, being a designer, um, thinking about it is, is almost a misleading title because you're designing so much more than what people might think. People might think that you're a designer, you make things look pretty, but actually what you're doing is you're identifying a problem or helping to refine what that problem is and why you're asked to do something. And then from there you're crafting a solution. And so now more than ever, and a lot of you I've noticed, even in the portfolio reviews, it's case studies now. You're not showing just screens of things. It's the thought process. It's like, what is my solution and what is it going to be? And then there's other things like working with teams, which can be challenging. Knowing when and how to escalate. So knowing what you need to flag to whoever you're reporting to or to your product manager or your project manager to be like, I'm not going to be able to do this in time, or I think that this is a risk, this doesn't pass accessibility compliance rules. Things like that. And presenting to get your peers and clients on board. So that ladders back to storytelling and working on your presentation skills. Presentation skills are something, even if it's not part of your job description, will only help you be like get yourself heard at the table more. Whether it's not a formal presentation, just practice. Every time you're sharing your work with someone in the office or on a call or whatever it might be, that's a presentation. And you want to kind of keep it as short as you can, concise as you can, but also as compelling as you can. Because it can be tough if you're going through a flow of 30 screens to keep that conversation going. So think of it as a story. And that comes in your work too. <clears throat> Once you practice brevity in your presentation skills, you start to apply it to your discipline in your practice and like feed it back into the ways of doing because you're articulating how the heck am I going to present this when it goes in front of the stakeholder, the prime, whoever, right? Design is a business. So we're going to get into some diagrams that are some shapes. There's <laughs> it's going to get real shapes. Well, I only have a few shapes. I think I have a triangle for you, a T, and a line. Yep. Um, but there's a lot of shapes. I'm not saying the other shapes are wrong because we all read a lot of Medium articles. We, we have a couple of waning crescent moons that are underneath the <laughs> I'm not triangle I'm not those. No, we're focusing on the triangle. Okay. Um, and you'll also see triangles with all different things. But the one that we're talking about today, I mean, all, all the triangles are important. But this one, being a designer, actually means people. So you could use that interchangeably. You'll see a lot of times in diagram. Um, working with empathy, human-centered design, you know, uh, making things for people that are you, and getting out of yourself and thinking about their experience and their usability. The business, often the hardest part for design to remember that you are there with a skill, solving a problem that the business needs to address. Even if it's like a nonprofit, doesn't matter. It's a business, you're trying to accomplish a task fundamentally for the strategy. So it's really important that you remember that. And the problem. So refining the problem. You might be given a, a challenge, again, going back to, you know, we're experiencing 50% drop off in checkout. They might say, um, make it easier to check out. And you might be like, oh, that might not be the problem. Um, so really refining to make sure that when you're spending time designing, you know exactly what that challenge is going to be. A great way to sell that is as mitigating risk for the company and making sure when you're investing time and money and resources to launch something, that you're launching something that is probably going to respond better than maybe the original idea. It's the T. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are also familiar with being a T-shaped designer. Um, it doesn't exactly have to be a T. I'm sure you've heard of my introduction. I do a lot of things. I like doing a lot of things. I'm not an expert in a lot of things. Um, I'm an expert in visual design. I'm an expert in UX. I'm not an expert in research, but I have experience, or in illustration, or in so many other things I do. But I have some capabilities in them. I have some interest in them. I can work with them and have an understanding of its limitations, of its timelines, and how it's going to impact my work as part of a broader group. 
And it doesn't have to be things in the design realm either. Getting to know how a project is structured and run is incredibly valuable. Getting to know how content strategy works, incredibly valuable. But make sure that you still have a pillar that you're focusing on. Even if all of your skills are at the same level, you're going to have a much better time leveling up when you can sell yourself as a specialization. And more often than not, when you're hired for a role, you might be called a UX designer, but you might do four different things. So it's, it's not as limiting as it seems like it might be. It might feel daunting if you love doing research and you love doing visual design that you have to choose one. You just go in as one and the opportunity will find itself once you start sharing what your additional skills are. Any company is gonna jump on that. So it's not like everything else is going to wither and die. Yeah. You could even love product in one of these sense, right? <clears throat> Understanding your product friends and uh, you know how they manage the product and like the product life cycle and the data that feeds into like there are so many different avenues where you can carve out your team. So I think you know as Laura highlighted, like just explore. That's where the other shapes like an M come in, where some people are trying to really quantify this and be like, no, you can have two or three. <laughs> it's all the same. Um, just have some focus. That is your first step forward, and then you bring the other ones along with you. It'll also help too if you're job hunting because often budgets are allocated for very specific things. So if you walk in and you're like, I do everything, that's very hard because your budget might be earmarked for a UX designer or a researcher or a design strategist. So to get in, don't, don't be afraid of just really focusing in and pitching on one. I think David probably talked about that a little bit. He had some shapes too. Yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so this is, I guess, the vertical line of the subway map. Um, being patient, I am fortunate enough, I work with a lot of really high-performing young designers on my team, and it's great, but it's hard, too, because as people are very, very confident very quickly, they're very proactive, they want to go, 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 and grow as fast as they can, but really, and I know it's hard to hear, some things just actually take time. It's things that you can't replicate or speed up no matter how good you are at your job. It's having the experience of some really difficult clients or a team that you really don't click with or a team who really do that you can't jump that progression because it's gonna grow you so much as a person as well as a designer. So talking about the doing versus the thinking, so this is a lot more immediate focus on doing, growing into doing a lot more of the thinking, right? And then the leadership. Leadership, by the way, lead designer, it doesn't always mean that you're managing people. You can be working in leadership and be a designer because it's about having vision that you share and you sell and that's compelling and guiding the tone and the culture. Meanwhile, also being a manager, think of that as a more literal thing where people report to you formally and you approve their vacation. <laughs> They're different things. I'm a senior manager. They're different things. But you, obviously you can do both. But one is a set of tasks and the other one is being a leader to a team and motivating them and setting the tone. And also, yes, some organizations are flatter than others. Um, I know that's a big question. I've worked in places that have eight levels up to a creative director. I've worked in places that have 15, right? Um, you might start as a junior art director or an interaction designer or a web designer, and it's all the same job. So some places will be like designer, senior designer, director. Some places will be more structured like this. Some will be bigger, some will be smaller. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to kind of gauge where you sit on that. So some of the stuff that Andrew's going to get into is going to help you figure out, looking at other places with other org frameworks, where you might sit within them right now and what your next step should be regardless of what your title is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. There you go. So this by no means is gospel. Again, like back to the first slide, it's a framework. Right? A lot of juniors that I talk to don't know what's expected of them. These are core things that are expected of you as a junior 
or a new grad entering into a junior internship position. This is what you build your baseline. You understand these principles and these philosophies and how they coagulate together, and then you formulate how you approach that in your discipline in your teams and how that benefits back into the company, back into the culture, back into the design guild, back into some of the rituals that you're a part of, whether it's critiques, reviews, and things like that. If you know what's expected of you, you're informed. The more you inform yourself as a practitioner, as an individual, the better you'll be at your craft. And so this is a core for which you evolve that. I'll have to say about this one. Next slide. <clears throat> so, as a junior, once you've established yourself as a junior, it's okay to peek ahead. Have a look to see what's expected of you as an intermediate. How do you know where to go unless it's established for you? And this is on, like, some of you are going to end up in very different roles. If you're going to end up at a startup where, where there's more ambiguity and you're a junior and you're just like, Holy shit, where, you know, where am I? Where are the, where are the guardrails? Where are the things that uh, shape who I am? So it's on you to actively seek this out. You know, you're gonna wear a ton of hats, but at the same time, you need to align back to something that you can be measured on, that you can measure yourself on and how you're gonna progress. So as you're a junior, look forward, man. Like, what does it take to get to the next steps? Uh, I think the VP of product at Dribble mentioned when he was, interviewing a product manager who said, I want to race. He's like, oh yeah, here's a list of things you're not, you know, that aren't your core competence. And once you accomplish these, you'll get that race. Same thing here, same principle. You accomplish this, you get that promotion. You show that in your portfolio, if you're leveling up inside of your board, internally, you know, it's like, what value did I drive back into the business? What KPIs did I align myself to that drove business results? that drove maturity in the practice and the way we approached this. All that matters. Your voice matters. As a junior, you're uninhibited. Uh, this year, we took four students from OCAD 4. I worked with Zeb. He's up there somewhere. From all different disciplines. One was like an uh, illustrator. And like, when it came to a design thinking exercise where the leads injected them into the business, they asked the craziest questions because they weren't inhibited, you know? Like they, they had no preconception of like what B2B was or whatever. We were just in there solving and asking design questions. That's beauty right there. Like that is the value of you as a junior. You have zero bias because you don't know what you don't know. You come in with a clear mind and a clear head. And to me as a senior, as a leader in the industry, that's what I give a shit about. I give a shit and you're coming in and you're injecting culture that I'm not exposed to, thinking that I'm just probably too seasoned to even like approach, and you're feeding that back into our guild. And so all that matters. We have 60 designers across the country. Not enough juniors as far as I'm concerned, but you know, we're, the way we're set up, we might need more seniors than juniors, but changing that perception and that thinking is like my job as a leader, right? To, to show the value of having these minds in the organization and aligning it back to this. So this doesn't just resonate with you as a designer, it has to go to the business too, it has to go to the stakeholders and they have to understand the value that design brings to the business. And all these types of activities, they're like uh, diagrams and things we're talking about today, it does that, it articulates that. And if the company gives a damn about that, they're gonna be a better company for it. Well, probably, you know, like innovation happens in creativity. And design thinking unleashes creativity. Not the doing. The doing is the act of the creativity and the innovation. So then we got operating models. <clears throat> so I abide by this. I don't know if I communicate it to my teams as, as well as they uh, might like or whatever, but this, this diamond approach is, is how I, I lead. You know, like, when we have a problem, I converge. I stop everything I'm doing, I find a whiteboard, I grab Marie, I grab my design lead, and we go and we hash it out. We're building software, like my team's doing software, we build products. So when the product is kind of hit a roadblock, we all come together, we converge. We discover, we define, and then we come back, and we, and we sort of iterate that back into the group. We work with technology, we work with product, 
we drive that sort of evolution of the things we're, we're striving for. And that happens in the dynamo. And everything's measured along this process. It's all tied to KPIs. If we're not hitting the KPIs, we're not driving meaningful business, and we should stop designing. At the end of the day, we're not going to have any lift. And I really recommend that you all spend a few minutes on your own and look into the double diamond, another shape. And um, all the shapes. I know, like my team in the UX strategy, we're doing a lot of foresight and thinking about what future products are going to look like and what the future experience is going to be. We use this model as well. It's really common. A lot of companies are using it, and even large enterprises that are looking to scale up or going through a digital transformation. Um, everyone is using this where they'll be marginally different, but you know, expand collapse repeatedly. But I find that this part right here is when you're going through and you have this wide, wide net, and then you're working with a group to really whittle it down and, and be heartless and chop your concepts and your ideas and your references that you love. Um, that's really important to also show in your portfolios because it might be like, I concepted and I came up with a ton of ideas, but I chose this one. Talk about why you chose that one. Um, because often that's the most telling part of the project and also making sure that you're identifying your problem properly. Amen. Next slide. directly attached to product. This is, you know, like when you're modeling products, you can also model your team. You know, like your 70% core is your key the lights on. Like what do we need to do to maintain design and consistency at scale? That's the 70%. You know, that's, that's using your tool set, using your thinking, and like progressing the company like at the pace that you're used to going to. The 20% that's adjacent, those are the things that are tangible within the, you know, the, the life cycle of whatever it is you're trying to get done in a year. Like, you set realistic goals and that 20% that you guys are evolving to, moving as a collective to design and achieve, whether it's features added to like a platform or whatever. The 10% is your North Star. And that's what is everybody driving towards. So what's, the, what's the future future state of what we're striving towards, right? It might be pie in the sky right now, but if you don't think like that, if that's not where you're evolving, you're fucked. You know, you'll never get there. You'll just live in 70% core all the time, and it'll be 90% core and maybe 10% adjacent. So you have to be cognizant of what growth looks like. What does growth look like for me as an individual? But what does it look like for the things we're working on and the group that's working on it with? You know, how do we need to upskill? Does someone need to learn research? Do we tap back into the team? Do we figure out you know, is there something we're missing? Is it emotion principle? Is it this? Is it that? And that's part of the critical thinking that goes into like the life cycle of a design team. And, and like your core function inside that design team. You need to think like this. And it all comes back to KPIs, team KPIs. Like, do we have a mission statement? Does everyone know what the mission statement is? Are we, are we too scared to ask what the mission statement is? You know, those are the things you need to ask yourself. Am I in the right environment? I, Am I getting the things out of this job that I need to evolve as a design team? Are the KPIs, the performance indicators, in the group that I'm in aligning to my personal KPIs? And if they aren't, either move around in the company or get the fuck out of there. You're wasting your time. Because there's, you know, you're just going to languish. You're not going to evolve and you're not going to develop. Can we get just a basic definition of a KPI? Like what KPI stands for and what it is? Next slide. <laughs> Should I like a work? company KPI? Yeah. No. You totally run, run with Key it. Key performance indicator. You have to say what acronyms are. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got all the shapes and all the acronyms. <laughs> so, when you work at a company like Telus, the marketing people have KPIs. They use that to measure how the company performs and how they either drive customer effort reduction, uh, conversion funnels, uh, attrition, things like that. Like what, what does the customer life cycle and the journey look like for the company? You know, like what, for us it's average revenue per user or customer or whatever, like over the life cycle of your contract. How does this play into what we're building for you service-wise in software 
that's going to alleviate some of the pain points you have with the company. So that's where KPIs internally align back to external KPIs that the company measures its, uh, you know, sort of value in the marketplace. <clears throat> Is that good? Yeah. A little, a little too corporate, maybe. I, I'm just glad you said that. <laughs> but so the next slide, let's jump to it. So right now, I want you guys to think about things that matter to you. And some of you that I've already talked to you today, like you have your passion projects. Uh, Graham is around here somewhere. Uh, there he is, he's over there. So he was showcased earlier today by the dean of this school because he followed his passion. He identified what was important to him. It was culture, huge, we talked about that. It was design and was art and community. And he brought all those together and he produced something that was tangible and, and sort of tapped back into all those things that were important to him. And he used that to get himself ahead. You know, and I talked to him, he's, he's interning at Anomaly right now, and he's figuring out what his next steps are from that. And I told him, you've already done it, you're a leader. You took everything that was valuable to you and you turned it into something that's tangible. And so that, for him, was her, his, his performance indicators was his culture, and like expressing his culture through design, and creating something from that that could be leveraged in, in like a t-shirt company, or like a clothing company in general, from like art form and things like that. So now I'm gonna challenge all of you to define your personal KPIs, and I guess send them to the Twitter feed, is that free? Where are you? Well, or you can just shut them out, I don't know. <laughs> Stick up your hand if you have one, but... Also, oh. think well. about, um, you know, a lot of them are, are easier to measure than others. If you're going to focus on developing design culture, that's a hard one. How do you measure that? But there's lots that are really easy, because I imagine for all of us, it's going to be like, be a better designer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, okay, cool. But stop and think about it. It's like, okay, I'm going to commit to listening to two podcasts on a regular basis, read these three books, and get a design mentor to critique my work um, inside or outside my company on a regular basis. Or I'm going to learn iOS inside and out, um, uh, HCI guidelines. So try and think of like actual things. Like basically, if your manager can check it off a list, that makes their job so much easier because then they need the ammunition to go into bat for you. And if they can be like, no, this person has done all this work, instead of just being like, they've improved, they can be like, these are things that they've done, and this is why they deserve it, and they've put in this effort. Proof points. So yes. Yeah. Back it up the slide, please. Sorry. These are things you should be asking yourself. <clears throat> just as a baseline to establish how you're gonna progress as a person, as a, uh, designer, as a leader, you know, whatever it is that Laura just talked about that's valuable to you. This text available, uh, Laura, and I, Laura and I posted on LinkedIn, so take pictures or whatever, but if, if there's a public version of the deck available if you want to come back and reference this. Does anyone want to share uh, a KPI idea or have any questions for us? We have uh, a oh, question on Slido. Okay. So, uh, for Laura specifically, <laughs> that have a young design practice and undefined growth paths, what is your advice for leveling up when there are no structured rules? Find decks like this. Um, what you can do is what I always recommend to people is, you know, say you're starting as a junior and you're trying to figure out how to convince the place that you work at, maybe you don't report to a single other creative there, especially if you're, you're a rogue designer by yourself. Um, collect job descriptions of what an intermediate would be. All of them. Keep them. Organize them. Because that will share with them what a framework looks like, what a design growth scale actually looks like. Because often, people have no idea if it's from a different field. They might just be like, you're still junior because you only been here for two years and you're like uh actually i'm doing a lot more than that so having evidence out there of other companies and what their systems are is extremely helpful um also looking just doing some general searches around design organization systems will help as well um, to help you determine you know 
what the right fit would be at that company, if it's a flat org or would be highly structured. Awesome. Andrew, uh, your favorite topic. So there's a question on how much do job titles matter? What do you do if you hold an important title uh, at a small org, but you want to move into a big org? You know, there's so many different uh, dependencies there. Um, don't, like, we have a slide where it said be patient. Be patient. You know, like it's going to happen for you. I got started late. I didn't discover. I just. I had to go work to figure out that I needed to come here and, and learn uh, the practical side, like the, the analytical side of like design, right? Like, don't be afraid to try something and, and like move from there. I don't know. Is that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I think it's like a. As you said, that there is no kind of one right way to it. Like job titles yeah. do matter at times, but there's so much context. Like again, like the previous question, you could be in a startup that has right. a very immature design practice, right. but you're learning things and gaining experience, so you're extracting what you need out of that to inject yourself back into something that's more mature. So if you enter into an organization and you have two years of experience and you're calling yourself an intermediate, and you come from that environment. Probably not an intermediate, but that's okay. Because, like, identify it back to the slide, like I had that <clears throat> if I go in and demonstrate that skill set that an intermediate has that this company has established in its mature practice, I can get that sooner than later because I have that two years of wearing different hats at the startup, right? It'll be more real for you. Like, you, have, you do have tangible work process. <laughs> Just keep it real. Yeah. Uh, Laura, how did you break into UX as someone with an illustration background? Sometimes I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a long time ago. Actually, it was before all these awesome programs and boot camps and everything else existed. Um, it was kind of like everyone who worked in digital just kind of ended up there. Um, I took time off after illustration, and with the help of a couple friends who were juniors in the industry, I made a portfolio. I taught myself some basic design, and I just kind of went to town on it and played to my strengths, which was um, pulling on illustration. So I did like a lot of heavy illustrative stuff and just like crazy marketing ideas, and I made a, uh, a little site, and I probably got rejected from 50 places, at least. And one place gave me an interview and they hired me because they thought some of my illustrations were funny. And <laughs> that's really why. And um, that, that was probably about 15 years ago or so. But from there, it was like I was a visual designer, whatever that is or was. Maybe I was an interaction designer. I don't remember. UX didn't exist. And kind of through there, I worked as a visual designer, art director type for quite a while. But as you're surrounded by product and you're working on it more and more and more, before it was called the product, you start asking questions about you know when someone would give you wireframes. Because in Waterfall, that's how it would be. It's like the UX does everything, and then it goes to the visual person. But you start asking more and more questions. And you notice that you don't agree with things that are being done. And so it, to me, there's like a huge interdependency between any kind of visual design, whether it be illustrative or UX, um, it's trying to communicate something to someone in one way or another. And it's just doing that through an expression of like shape and color and, and then building some interactivity in on it, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me. Communicating and, <laughs> and trying to find the most effective way of doing it. But to literally cross the boundaries into getting into UX, um, time and persistence. If you start doing it, you are working in UX. It's not a sticker or a check mark that you get. Last question, um, quite a quote. Five people want to know from Andrew. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we create roles for ourselves that don't yet exist in the company when we identify a need and how it can add value to the collective whole? Service it. Show value. Attach it to business value within the company. So when when we roadshow, when my team does a big release, any of my team, my product teams, and tell us when we do a big release, we roadshow. 
and I, and I go and I inject myself and my team into an incubator situation, or um, you know, we, I came. That's how Laura and I came together. It was was just we asked each other, like, "What are you doing? What are you doing? I need help on this. How do I do this?" And like, that's it, man. It's community. It's Design X, and then it's your work community, internally and externally, and, and like connecting those dots and going and sharing the work that you do. It's no big secret. We're all chasing the same goals. We're all chasing the same outcomes. Go and talk about it. Share it. Socialize your whatever you do, right? Like, um, bring it together. To me, like, once you do that and you show, like, uh, what you're doing has innovation attached to it, <clears throat> and you can articulate and define the things that you need to do with the performance indicators and back to the business value. At the end of the day, like, you know, the, the things you're working on drive value back into the startup, the business, whatever it is. Same thing with like organization. You know, like the better organized you are, the more consistent you are, you're going to save the company money. You know, bad design creates technical debt. It also creates UX debt. It's all hand in hand. Like if you're if you're not thinking of of patterns and like how how they cause negative effects on the business, you're in a bit of trouble. You know, you're just going to end up doing double the work. So it's like, hey. We can do half the effort if we define this and sort this out and become more organized, and we can deliver at speed, at velocity. You want these releases done in this quarter? We'll get it done if we're better organized. Keeping it real. I always love it. That's our big round of applause for Laura.